Шановні друзі, від імені фонду Аксані Цюніка від Київ України дозвольте привітати вас на сьогоднішньому заходу. Я думаю, дуже багато з вас вже були на наших попередніх заходах в рамках проєкту «Відкрий світ». І знаєте, що це ми робимо регулярні зустрічі щомісяця з відомими закордонними експертами, дипломатами. Переважно це тематика міжнародних відносин. І переважно ми орієнтуємося в наших зустрічах на молодь, молоді професіонали, у сфері міжнародних відносин і безпеки, журналісти, політологи. Ну і також запрошуємо старше коло дипломатів і експертів, щоб була комунікація між ними. І сьогодні в нас дуже цікавий гість, і також, напевне, ви знаєте, що ми зустрічі традиційно проводимо англійською мовою. So, I will start to introduce it in English. We have a very honorable guest today, a person who is a very close friend of Ukraine, and he's staying here for several years, and he was here in Ukraine for a very difficult for our country period. Uh, so I'm pleased to introduce to you uh, Ambassador uh, Jan Tombinski and as we agreed with Ambassador, uh, we will speak today about the future because we know a lot what happened in our country. Uh, we know a little bit about the basement for the future we have at the moment. Uh, I believe we can speak about what we basement we would like to build. And uh, accordingly, uh, I believe we can help uh, prospects on what future of our country can be uh, concerning internal development, external development, our place in Europe, and our personal role in all these developments. So I believe a personal role will be our target for our discussion because, you know, uh, we can demand something from president, prime minister, from courts, etc., etc. but uh, if we doesn't uh, do anything for change, so uh, our demands are useless. Uh, so I believe we will start our communication and Ambassador will have about 10 minutes for his presentation on the topic. And after that, feel free uh, to give comments, questions, uh, whatever you like uh, and whatever you are interested in. So Ambassador, please. Good afternoon, it's already afternoon, uh, sorry. Good afternoon and th thank you for this invitation and uh, I'm honored to be here and uh, to continue this uh, discussion of myself with Ukrainian colleagues and uh, with Ukrainian citizens about uh, what uh, Ukraine is to be uh, for the future and what do you wish from Ukraine because the main driver of everything what happens in the Ukraine is this Ukrainian ownership of uh, Ukrainian changes and of Ukrainian future. Yesterday I participated in an interesting discussion in Bratislava commemorating 25th 5th anniversary of Visegrad group and we were talking about how it happens that this Visegrad group started in 90 and 91 between these countries of Central Europe at that time Poland Czechoslovakia and Hungary and one of main driving ideas was to go to be ahead of history, to learn the lessons from the past and to do everything in order not to be the prisoner of bad past, but to shape the future. So these leaders of three countries, they decided to do everything in order to avoid that nationalism, differences, conflicts are the driving engine for politics of three countries. And I wish only to recall how big the tensions in the beginning of 90s were between Slovakia and Hungary because of minority, because of the past, because of uh, different stories during the Second World War, how big the differences were between Poland and Poles and Czechs because of the old year because of also different histories, how big the tensions were among these countries, how big the potential for conflicts were. So my first advice to you, the young generation of Ukraine, is to be ahead of history, to learn the lessons from the past, to learn the lessons from others, to open windows to 
different examples how others did shape their own future and try to do it in everyday political practice in Ukraine. Ukraine is a country with a very heterogenic pattern of uh, histories, regionals, uh, uh, paths uh, of uh, different references. This country did know the common administrative structure only for past 60 years after the integration of Crimea in former Soviet Union to Ukraine in 1954. But before the Second World War, the territory of today's Ukraine belonged to different countries. So people had different references. But they were united by this sense and spirit, we belong together to Ukrainian ethnos. But out of this singing about nation and Ukrainian ethnos, what still remains to be done is the creation of lasting institution of statehood. I'm very much puzzled in Ukraine because of this dominance of ethnic element in the thinking of Ukrainians, we the Ukrainians, but less about the sense of building lasting institutions for the statehood. Jean Monnet, one of the founding fathers of the European Union, used to say this is a very famous phrase that nothing happens without man, nothing lasts without institutions. And this is very much true for the state. And Ukraine pays now a huge price for all the absence of careful action how to build structures of the statehood for the past 25 years. We are going to celebrate 25 years of Ukrainian independence. A huge achievement of your predecessors. Most of you do not remember or even do not know the other times than the independent Ukraine. But uh, this is nothing that you have to take for granted. To have a state means an everyday investment in what the state means. In Ukraine, to this need to build and create it lasting, efficient institutions of statehood, comes also another task together. This is uh, the task of internal integration. I'm traveling quite often, quite, quite a lot, through different regions of Ukraine. And I'm always surprised by the lack of internal integration, how little Ukrainians who live in Chernihiv region know about Ukraine of uh, Volhynia, or how little people from Zakarpatia know about what happens even in the region of Odessa or in Mykolaiv. This internal Ukrainian integration is something that should also be taken as a big task, as a big must to do by all who are conscious about the Ukrainian future. Because the lack of integration is always an invitation to others to work on the visions and to exploit the lack of uh, coherence within the Ukrainian nation. So this is a lesson from the past that you should take with you also as future leaders of Ukraine and to invest in the knowledge of their own country and in integrating your fellow colleagues, your fellow brothers and sisters from Ukraine, from different regions. Another element that uh, is a fundament of fundamental importance for the future of Ukraine is to take the state seriously. For many years, Ukraine did suffer from the imitation 
of political institutions, of political life, of political culture. The political parties were not political parties in the sense of uh, uh, what should the political party be with a kind of a well presented program and being accountable for this program. They were groups of lobbyists for this or other group of interest. The lack of institutions. Uh, we all uh, are so often confronted with uh, all the criticism on judiciary system, on prosecution, on different institutions of the state. Because this hasn't been done with a sense of seriousness of the task what these institutions have to deliver for the purpose of the society. This lack of uh, seriousness in uh, considering what state is, is also something that impacts on today's situation of Ukraine. So laying fundamentals for the future is knowing the past and trying to draw the lessons from everything that was done wrong in order to do it better in the future also looking at experiences of others. To invest in the internal integration of the country in order to overcome these internal divisions and to lower the threats of others to play or your lack of knowledge of what Ukrainian is. And third, to take your state seriously and to take everyone who is in different public positions accountable for how these people do serve the country. Because executing mandates in the parliament, executing different state functions, is not only executing some competences of power, but serving the purpose of the nation. Could it be enough for the introduction? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and uh, um, now it's your turn to uh, to ask the questions or comments you really do care about and you are interested in. And uh, uh, one more issue is that you can do it in Ukraine if you feel that your English doesn't allow you because the ambassador do, uh, uh, does understand Ukrainian very well, speaks very well, and uh, oh, at least I can help with, with translation. Uh, and one more thing is that uh, you see uh, our colleague over there with microphone. Uh, so, uh, uh, so when giving questions, please take microphone for everybody to hear you, and please introduce yourself, who you are, from what institution, university, uh, organization, etc., for us to know more about your background. So we can start. I see one hand over there. Only please be short. Hello, Mr. Ambassador. My name is Maxim Yali, P um, politologist, uh, PhD in political science, Institute of World History of the National Academy of Sciences of Ukraine. So uh, I have several questions, quick. So the latest news uh, today, I read <coughs> that uh, today, as a, an ambassador of the EU, yeah, um, the mi internal ministers of EU were supposed to, uh, have, to hold a meeting today concerning granting uh, visa-free regime to Ukraine, but it was written that uh, they will just discuss, but no decision uh, will be made, which means that uh, this process will be postponed at least until the September due to procedures. So how can we consider it and maybe you comment what are the obstacles? And uh, second, uh, quick questions concerning the consequences of yesterday voting in French uh, Senate concerning uh, shifting or smoothening sanctions against Russia. Uh, how would you comment and which consequences can it have on uh, the process, peacekeeping process, I mean uh, the development of the conflict in Ukraine. And the last one, just uh, what are your expectations of the Minsk process 
taken into account that it has come to a deadlock because uh, uncontrolled territories do not want uh, to grant uh, uh, access to the border. Ukrainian government doesn't want to hold uh, elections, so the situation seems just like a deadlock. What are the perspectives from your point of view? Are there any alternatives to Minsk process? Thank you very much. I was supposed not to come to the press conference on uh, these uh, issues because these issues have been already asked by journalists. Uh, 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 and uh, I wanted to engage in uh, uh, more in this going and uh, forthcoming discussions. Uh, Visa-free regime uh, is something that uh, is under discussion for six years. And I know how eager Ukrainians are to have it done. But I have also to return the question why it took so long to implement all what has been agreed in 2010 and why it took so much effort on our side to press Ukrainian government, Ukrainian parliament to adopt what was needed to be adopted uh, by the Ukrainian side in order to open this possibility. So now I see that uh, the attention is shifting to the European Union members, but let me return to uh, one element that is uh, of more general importance and uh, if you are studying politology or if you are do doing the PhD in politology, it is worth considering. This is the value of time in politics. To do things, what, to do what is done, what is to be done in the right time. Because if things are not done in the right time, a country may become a hostage, a prisoner of all other issues around. Using these windows of opportunity is the big knowledge of everyone who wish to be a, a really statesman. This is my answer to it. We know what is going around here yeah? and you also have to understand what is the responsibility of inter ministers of interior of European member states. They are accountable within their own countries for the internal security of respective countries. With all the accumulation of all questions around, they will think twice before taking the, the, such decisions because this is something that overlaps or amalgamates with questions that have nothing to do with visa-free regime for Ukraine. But in a public opinion, it is very sensitive. And every minister of interior who goes to Brussels and who is about to take the decision has to get first the mandate from his own parliament and then to be accountable in front of its own parliament. These are not Ukrainians who vote for governments or for ministers in other countries. They are, these ministers are responsible in front of their own citizens. The other issues, uh, the vote of the Senate in, uh, uh, in France uh, or uh, the uh, question of Minsk talks. We've seen uh, different comments already from different uh, uh, Ukrainian uh, uh, m uh, representatives of government uh, or different commentators about uh, uh, this vote uh, of uh, French Senate. Uh, Ukraine has also to open windows and to look what's going on in the world around. This is not a legislative act, this resolution of the French Senate, but it is also a call on Ukrainians uh, that you should create a kind of a Ukrainian project. 
that attracts other and helps other to be a part of a Ukrainian success. This absence of the understanding that Ukraine is on the path to success is something that impacts also on the discussions about uh, what next. However, what is the common position of all European member states is that sanctions were introduced because of the illegal annexation of Crimea and because of aggression against Ukraine. The reasons which were at the beginning of the decision of introducing sanctions against Russia hasn't been gone, are still there. Therefore, the decisions of member states and those who have a mandate to take these decisions in Brussels uh, uh, at the European Council in uh, first days of July will be based on whether the reasons for sanctions do exist still or cease to exist. Minsk process, uh, you uh, commented in, uh, about it from the point of view of uh, uh, what we see, uh, how little progress we see. Yes, we do not see progress in Minsk talks. Uh, we see even more violation now. We see uh, uh, more ceasefire breaches. We see uh, 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 more problems than solutions for the time being uh, uh, around, but it is the only structures that we have to discuss about the future uh, solution for this what happens unfortunately in the east of Ukraine and where millions of Ukrainians are taking hostages of this conflict. I will not adventure myself in commenting or uh, trying to uh, uh, present you an alternative scenario what may come out of the talks. Today the, or tomorrow the uh, trilateral contact group uh, will have a meeting once again. There is a huge investment of goodwill of everyone from outside to uh, help to find solutions in the interest of people and in respect of international law, which means sovereignty and territorial integrity of Ukraine. But it takes two to tango. Okay, uh, so, uh, and um, maybe before we continue with audience, I also have uh, have question more, more concerning the future, because for me, what happened during year Ramadan was something I didn't expect to. I was for many years dealing with civil society and uh, didn't expect that it is developed in the way uh, it was revealed during. So was for you also a surprise to see during uh, your Ramadan something you didn't expect to, and how do you think it can be used for, 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 for future reforms in Ukraine, uh, uh, its full potential? I didn't have any previous experience with Ukraine. Uh, I came uh, to Kiev uh, in autumn 2012, so I couldn't compare this what happened in late 2013 and beginning 2014 with any previous uh, uh, big movement in Ukraine. But for me, uh, this what happened uh, during this uh, uh, more than three months of uh, uh, protests in uh, Kiev, uh, and not only in Kiev, we tend to forget that the Maidan even tried to uh, install on the streets in Donetsk, uh, or they were uh, manifestations uh, in November in favor of signing the association agreement in Sevastopol on Kerch. So this is something also to uh, uh, not to be uh, forgotten uh, by all uh, who will write the history of Maidan. This was a general called We the Citizen. This famous phrase of uh, American Constitution, We the People, could be uh, uh, phrased here, We the Citizens. This, because people wanted to be taken seriously 
I alluded to it, that uh, the public sphere is to be taken seriously. And you, in November 2013, you've asked, you called for being taken seriously as citizens. Citizens to whom no one, being president or being government or being parliament, can say we are going in one direction and then without any specific explanation saying no, 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 uh, we stop this direction, we are going in another direction uh, and uh, we, uh, uh, this what we were telling you yesterday is no more valid uh, because uh, we did make up our minds and uh, we did change uh, our orientations. This is something that uh, entails a huge public, uh, not only unrest, but uh, your feeling of being taken as objects and not subjects of political life. And citizens are the subject of political life. As very often I'm asked a question about European values, how to uh, resume this difference uh, or this core meaning of what it does mean, the European values. I very often refer to this difference between the dominance of collective will and uh, the need to put individual person as a subject of uh, everything that goes on in a public sphere. The European institutions and European legal system is uh, uh, basically uh, built on the principle of protection of every individual person and on granting to a the individual or smaller ones a specific advantage in the development against the biggest and against the strongest. This is the purpose of the European Council. The vote of Luxembourg and vote of Germany until recently were taken equally. Member states are equal, big or small. The same in the different counts about how many deputies in the European Parliament are there between small and the big. This is a certain advantage given to the smallest against the biggest. You may see it also through the European legislation in everything that concerns economical activity anti-monopolistic structures and anti-monopolistic regulations of European Union are the strongest in a sense of avoiding the possibility that someone dominates the market. So no more than 30% share on the market is allowed. Why? Because it will be, if someone gets bigger share, it will be against the freedom of economical activity. The regulator should create a space for everyone, small, medium, size enterprise, to have its place on the market. The same goes with the regulations of protection of consumers. Because this is about protecting rights of every individual, because we all are consumers. We are the end users of goods, of services, of different rights in the European Union. And uh, therefore, this protection of rights of consumers against rights of producers is also an element of putting the everyone in the center of attention of uh, what institutions are doing. The same goes for all kinds of protection of minorities. This is not about promotion of minorities, but protecting rights of everyone to be taken as a human being. 
not that the rights of collective wisdom or collective general sense. Who defines the collective general sense? No one. No? This is always something that uh, uh, gives a way, paves a way to a, a misinterpretation by some groups of people who decide about what the collective will is. Therefore, we break this rule of collective will and put the individual rights in the center. So this is something that goes with uh, what you've said about uh, Maidan. This was your call. We the citizens, we wish to be taken seriously, everyone from the Ukrainian society. And I may only add one sentence to it. On the 1st of December 2013, I visited, together with another colleague ambassador, the presidential administration, asking about what is your plan? What is the plan of President Yanukovych? What do you wish to do? Uh, and the answer was, President knows that he has to sign the association agreement because 70% of professionally active population of Ukraine wishes the signing of the association agreement. That was the answer on the 1st of December 2013. Thank you. So we continue. Uh, we will have uh, Ambassador Wesołowski when uh, I, I saw young representatives and when we can come back to our old diplomats, <laughs> Ambassador Toriansky. So, and I would encourage young people also to think about their questions because yeah. we are doing this for you. <laughs> about the future, yeah. Uh, first of all, about the past. Uh, uh, let me praise Ambassador Mbinski for his uh, uh, very important very visible, uh, very um, effective work in Ukraine during the last four years. Um, we wish you stay. Um, maybe one day you return. Um, my question is uh, about the future. Uh, you, you rightly mentioned that um, uh, men do uh, mm, actions and then uh, the uh, uh, institutions lost. Uh, from where man appears? Man appears from the civil society. Man appears from the society. And my question is whether EU as a number of institutions, instruments, funds, people, etc., and centers, etc., etc., has a coherent plan to support civil society and to develop civil society in Ukraine because it is the most important moment. It is the civil society in Ukraine which uh, keeps Ukraine on the ground now. And it will be only the civil society which would produce new men and then new institutions. So. Um, we can really, uh, uh, we feel that some specific institutions or, uh, uh, or people or parliaments or etc. from EU do their job in that sense. But there is sometimes uh, a, a frustration. Who is doing what? Is there a coherent plan? We need it. Thank you. In developed societies and uh, in the modern world, society creates structures that are representatives of, uh, mm, the, uh, of different groups and minds of people. This is this representative democracy. Civil society is the main actor in the sense of being watchdog of what's going on in the country and triggering changes. But in order that the changes are of lasting character, it should be institutionalized. Civil society, by definition, is anarchic in the sense of 
creating new structures, creating new uh, groups of interests. Uh, this is something that is of this spontaneous character of expression of uh, will of groups of people. But the country lasted thanks to institutions. Therefore, this culture of dialogue between institutions who are empowered with a mandate to implement policy, to uh, adopt laws, to uh, follow what's going with the implementation of different laws, how institutions do work, how this public accountability is done, is something that is this backbone of the country. So in every country, this discussion between two is so much important. And therefore, we have also to return to something that I alluded to at the beginning, this question of uh, uh, limiting or avoiding any imitation. This is my call to journalists. You are part of a society as well, but you have a specific role of educating people to what it means to be well-informed citizens. If media are imitating being those who are bringing a variety of opinions to people and not only lobbying interests of the owner of this or other channel or this or other group of uh, 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 newspapers. Uh, this is something that is one of the illnesses of the Ukrainian system. But you need to have this tool of fair communication between what civil society is and uh, what institutions uh, do. I started my life also in the civil society as a member of Solidarność and student movements in Poland, but I understand how limited the possibility of civil society is to have lasting elements of politics. Because people do come, do go, People are changing minds, there are uh, different groups who come, always the question of legitimacy uh, uh, appears, who has uh, more legitimacy. If you don't have a public vote, if you don't have uh, political parties, if you don't have a parliament they work, if you don't have local self-governmental bodies that uh, have an authority and a mandate, then civil society will be unable to run the country. Therefore, two are important. We as the European Union, we are using Ukrainian NGOs, civil society, as partners of ours in impacting on reforms in Ukraine. We are trying to, or we are disclosing everything what we are discussing with the government Every conditionality of our support is in public domain in order that the society helps us also to detect what goes wrong with what we are doing as assistance to Ukraine because we don't wish to be assistance in bad political decisions. We wish you to be our help and to help us to detect what's going on and how to correct, if needed, our policy in order to impact in a sense of having a, bad, a good result, not a bad result of our assistance. Uh, thank you very much. So I see hand over there. Hi, my name is Mikola Sharodilo and I'm worrying incredibly for uh, the question uh, about the integration. Uh, uh, do you see any perspectives to integrate not only the Ukraine controlled by the legal power, 
but only especially uh, to mentally and culturally integrate the population of the uh, territories which are now under the Russian occupation. I mean Donbass and uh, annexed Crimea, because um, I know it's quite early to talk about this integration. We've got a very hard work to do to take those territories back to Ukraine, but nevertheless, I guess we we, we gotta think about it, and uh, uh, because it's not about to integrate uh, all the population, because. Uh, the older population, they are quite understandably very ag aggressive toward the European Union. And not only the European Union, but also NATO. But uh, what is more frightening is that the young generation of Donbass population, unfortunately, uh, are very aggressive towards the European values like tolerance and uh, freedom. And uh, it's not about even accepting, they are accepting these values. It's about at least understanding those values, like tolerance. Because it's very hard to understand that uh, the younger generation of Don occupied and best, uh, which are meant to promote European values, uh, I see a very sad picture. And this is the first question. And the short second question, it's about uh, uh, healing war wounds. Uh, can you see any uh, possibility to see uh, in the near future some kind of a Russian uh, Willy Brandt uh, which could ask for forgiveness in uh, uh, Baltic states, in Ukraine, in Poland for that shameful war parade, Krivoshein Guderian in Brest? I, I, know you, I think you know what I mean in 1939, because uh, this uh, asking for forgiveness is also a key uh, question, a, a very big key to uh, ensure the security uh, and establish good relationships between all the countries in Europe. Thank you very much. And thank you for your support, for your support in Ukraine in these hard times. Thank you. Thank you for this question that goes uh, uh, into the heart of uh, what uh, the obligation of uh, those who wish or who consider themselves leaders of the society is. This question of reconciliation is something that uh, uh, is very much also on my mind if I'm thinking about uh, not only Ukraine but uh, on what's going on uh, in Europe and uh, uh, especially in the eastern part of Europe. Uh, there was also part of uh, this activity with the Visegrad group to uh, help uh, in smaller scale also to reconcile different nations that were on different sides of uh, uh, political battles in the past. I was very much encouraged by the recent letter of uh, uh, intellectuals from Ukraine to uh, Poles about uh, the need to reconcile and to uh, uh, overcome the burdens uh, from uh, the 40s Lowing tragedy uh, in 43-44 to uh, really uh, uh, get in a genuine dialogue on it and not to be driven by all uh, these skeletons uh, from the wardrobes that will fall out uh, at one day. And this is also my message to all my Ukrainian colleagues, friends, uh, uh, who are active in public life, to keep communication channels to your friends, colleagues, relatives uh, in the Donbas non-governmental controlled areas or in uh, Crimea. You may not get a response immediately because these people they feel really the most targeted and uh, most uh, prisoners of what's going on, the victims of uh, everything. Uh, and people who suffer, they see everyone around being responsible for their suffering. 
This is also something that we know from different uh, uh, situations in the past. I was ambassador of Poland to Bosnia Herzegovina in 96, uh, 98. So I know uh, uh, this feeling uh, not only from school books or from history books, but also from my contacts. Uh, I don't think that people in Donbas have other understanding of the world than you have. They are now in a completely different situation. They have a completely different everyday reality uh, uh, they are conf confronted with in uh, their uh, everyday life. So they need to have these interlocutors and you have to have passions in talking to them. It will be hard. I understand that it will be very hard because uh, you uh, know that uh, the truth is on your side. So it is difficult to dialogue with people uh, who uh, contest this truth. But reconciliation requires a lot of courage and passions in even taking unjust injuries against you, but this need to upload this stress, tensions, and this feeling of being abandoned, forgotten by everyone, that these people are not needed more. Right? This is what you can also listen or write in, uh, read in different Ukrainian comments about the Donbass. Uh, forget about these people. They are not able to defend their houses. This is not as easy. And no one should be tempted to go through this uh, stereotype easiest uh, uh, vision of the situation. You know Donbass much better than I do. I was for the, my last visit to Donetsk was 28th February 2014 talking to journalists, talking to people in the city council, in a very tense ambience. I was before Maidan 4th of November at the university in uh, Donetsk, also talking to people and understanding uh, or trying to understand uh, uh, their mindsets. Not much differences in what they wish from their lives in the future than I see in Ternopil or uh, in Odessa. People wish to usefully use a potential and to have a space in which they are recognized. But they were deprived of this possibility to have their own say on their futures. If you remember the last reliable sociological surveys from Donbass from March or April 2014, already after Crimea annexation, no more than 17% of people were talking about separatism. More than 70 explained themselves in favor of staying in Ukraine with larger competences uh, 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 given to the local authorities and to uh, those who uh, represent the region. So the minds of people did not change so easily, but they have to have the space of expressing their minds. So keep your contacts open with everyone who lives on the other uh, side. Time will come for the reconciliation, but you have to be leaders of this reconciliation and to shape your language, your structures of this reconciliation. Uh, thank you. So uh, I promised to Ambassador to give him a floor. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, taking into account the information by Ukrainian mass media, Mr. Tombinsky is preparing to leave Ukraine. 
I do not have any authorization from this audience, but I would like to thank you on my own behalf, Mr. Tobinsky, for your stay in Ukraine, for your political position demonstrated in political life in Ukraine, and especially in the events organized by the auspice of uh, uh, Arseniy Yatsenyuk Foundation. Uh, being for a long time in diplomatic service, frankly speaking, I uh, don't remember any your predecessor who demonstrated such friendly, openly, open and frankly position as a permanent, as a representative of European Union in Ukraine. But I would like to think that everybody presented here will associate with these words addressed personally to you. Uh, then my question is that uh, you know that uh, political situation in Ukraine is very complicated today and two main questions are on the agenda item, Crimea and eastern part of Ukraine. Today we are witnesses uh, when the new political figure uh, uh, appeared on, the, uh, on political stage in Ukraine, Nadia Savchenko. Attention is attracted to her, to her position, and to her words. Two or three days she uh, announced that uh, her position is uh, to begin direct conversation, direct negotiations with uh, the leaders of so-called Donetsk and Lugansk People's Republic. My question is uh, addressed to you. How do you uh, consider how do you evaluate uh, this position because the reaction in mass media in Ukraine, in the political circle, uh, is different. And uh, the last point is I see on this very important rostrum for me and for us two prominent people sitting in the chairs of different color. White, Mr. Tompinski, and black, <laughs> Mr. <laughs> Taras. What does it mean or means in something or, or does it mean nothing? Thank you very much. Mr. Ambassador, thank you very much for your uh, very kind words. Uh, but uh, you as Ambassador, you also know that uh, our time is counted from the very first day of our stay in a country. Uh, so we are in this rotating mandate. Uh, so four years of my stay in Ukraine it will expire in August, so I stay until the end of August uh, dedicated to my work for EU and Ukraine and uh, to uh, the peace and to the stability in this region. So uh, uh, this is something that is my uh, driving idea for everything what I'm doing. Uh, and thank you very much for, for your very kind words. Uh, with regard to Nadia Savchenko, we are very happy that uh, she's uh, uh, on freedom, that uh, she's a free person. We did uh, what we could in order to help uh, to uh, attract international attention to a her case uh, that should have never happened uh, in uh, a modern world. But how to shape different discussions, how to uh, uh, shape discussions about uh, the future of uh, uh, east, uh, south, uh, southeast part of Ukraine, of uh, uh, this part that is uh, beyond the control of the government now, and what role Vladimir Savchenko should play in it. It is a question that shouldn't be addressed to me. The people who have mandate for Ukraine's future and for all what is, what is related to the uh, solution of the conflict in, uh, on the territory of Ukraine now. So for uh, any solution, the president, parliament or government uh, will take or that Nadia Savchenko will be authorized by those who have this mandate, we uh, don't have any position on it. Uh, this is a sovereign decision by a sovereign state and uh, those who represent the states 
with whom and by which means they wish to discuss about uh, how to settle this, uh, uh, this conflict. I guess more contacts are available than even we think, uh, because on both sides are also people who know each other very well. So for, uh, we don't have any say in it and we even don't engage in this uh, uh, different context. With regard to the color of the chairs, uh, I even uh, didn't realize that we are sitting on uh, chairs of uh, different colors, so I guess it is uh, without any political significance. Uh, uh, unless uh, uh, Taras uh, uh, explains us uh, uh, that it has one. Okay, I, I believe as a moderator I have to play a role of bad policeman, so I'm marked with black <laughs> color. <laughs> Uh, so, um, um, as, as, far as, uh, as far as I see, unless we resolve all uh, present issues, uh, we will have no chance to think about the future, yeah? <laughs> so, uh, okay, I'm still asking you to think also about the f fundamental things for our f building our future, but if you feel it's very interesting uh, for you personal issue, you can give this question. So, please, you. Я українською питання поставлю. Не розумію, чому інші не питають питання, не ставлять українською. Я поставлю українською, як перша людина. Дуже дякую за інформацію, тому що я вважаю, що ваш підхід, він насправді об'єктивний до ситуації в Україні. На жаль, не всі українці розуміють об'єктивність саме в аналізі, в аналізі усіх подій, що проходять, що трапляються, траплися та трапляться на Сході України. Це дуже важливо тримати об'єктивний підхід до, до цих подій. Мої питання стосовно участі, можливої участі Європейського Союзу у відновленні інфраструктури Донбасу. В Донецькій області було 28 міст обласного значення, 28 до, до трагічних подій. подій. Зараз залишилося 15, 13 під контролем сепаратистів. Які є або у майбутньому, можливо, будуть нові проекти щодо соціального культурної, економічної підтримки, наприклад, там, Краматорську, Маріуполь або інших міст. Це дуже цікаво, дуже, ну, наразі це актуально. І одна ремарка дуже важлива. Попередній доповідач сказав про те, що частина населення Донбасу, вона агресивно настроєна на НАТО, на якісь там інші питання, що стосуються Європи. Я почав, я, я, я почав посміхатися, як і мій друг Максим, адже Максим із Маріуполя, а я із Донецька. Ми дуже гарно знаємо ситуацію, яка взагалі там відбувається, які тенденції там відбуваються. Звісно, звісно, частина населення Донбасу, вона агресивність, ну, присутня вона стосовно Європейського Союзу, але це не більшість населення. Зараз вже тут точно можу це сказати. Тому дякую вам за об'єктивний підхід і дякую за ту підтримку, яку вже ви надаєте Донбасу підконтрольній частині. Зараз я говорю лише по підконтрольній частині України. Дякую. На якій мові? I will stick to English if you allow. Thank you for this words. I would never dare to say that someone has an objective uh, opinion uh, because uh, we all have uh, uh, our sources of information and uh, you may get also other sources of information and you could have even more objective uh, uh, opinion uh, than uh, we have. So I don't uh, pretend to have uh, all the sources of information. I try to uh, use all my knowledge as historian and as a uh, uh, diplomat uh, with uh, more than 25 years of uh, experience from different regions uh, uh, to uh, uh, look at uh, mm, this uh, psychological and social structures because they are even more lasting than some political ones uh, uh, in different regions. What is the mindset of people, I would not dare to say, uh, because you have to go to very specific uh, analysis. What 
I've read in different books about identity of Donbas, and there were for past 25 years a lot of uh, different studies done, especially to compare Western Ukrainian identity and Donbas identity. Uh, what I've learned from these books were the meaning of uh, the, what sociologists do attribute to Donbas is rather a functional identity, not an ethnical identity. The functional identity which goes with different professions executed, uh, very similar to the identity of people in Polish Silesia or in Ruhrgebiet in Germany in 19th century where there were several millions of people from other nations working in this area, the same in northern France, not pas calais where you have huge variety of uh, different uh, uh, nationalities uh, in one area, nationalities, or people of different nationalities who came because of working possibilities. But what was missing in this Donbas area was the sense of belonging. They were far away from all other centers, far away from Moscow, far away from Kiev, and it created a sense of uh, Donbas specificity, that we belong to us in a certain way. This is what I learned in different books. Uh, uh, about them. And the question of uh, uh, which political structure we belong to was a bit secondary to this first, we belong to us. But Donetsk, Wuhansk, or West were voting majoritarian for Ukraine in 91. This is a political effect, and it should be always taken as a basis for every father political decisions because the will of people has been expressed for people in the referendum about the Ukrainian uh, uh, independence voted in order to stay with Ukraine so this is the only political fact that we should refer to and it has been recognized as a part of Ukraine in multilateral bilateral treaties so uh, the international law should be the basis for uh, all further discussions. But as you refer to these different assistance programs, uh, uh, we are trying to uh, mobilize as much as we can. We've mobilized in, 19, in 2014 uh, more than 17 million euro f as a first remedy to uh, the crisis, uh, housing for people, uh, 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 assistance uh, to uh, uh, universities, schools uh, that had to uh, um, move out of um, the previously um, of a previous um, location uh, uh, in in Donbas. We've mobilized as the European Union a huge amount of money for direct humanitarian assistance. It's uh, now mostly. 45 million euros that have been mobilized and dedicated to different uh, specialized agencies uh, uh, to this uh, population and not only on the territories that is controlled by the government. Its assistance goes also to the population on uh, the territory uh, uh, that is uh, uh, out of the control of the government and goes also to people who did leave Donbas, even living in Belarusia. So it is also something to be uh, taken into account. Uh, recently, we've opened a new project for uh, reconstruction of administration and some infrastructure in bon Donbas, 10 million euro worth uh, opened uh, and signed uh, uh, a week ago uh, in uh, Krematorsk uh, with the local administration. 30th of May I was in Mariupol uh, talking to uh, business uh, people about the way how to help people to uh, create new uh, working places, uh, access to credit, access to, to money. Uh, 
Together with World Bank and UNDP, uh, uh, the European Union uh, worked out a study about the reconstruction of uh, uh, Donbass, including some ideas about how much it would cost. But without security, without proper access to the territory, uh, we will not be able to have a comprehensive approach. We have only the approach now to the site which is controlled by the Ukrainian government because we are working only with Ukrainian authorities for this territory because this is a part of Ukraine. On the other side, we may reach out with humanitarian assistance, but with everything that concerns investments, reconstruction, we only work with Ukrainian authorities. Uh, thank you very much. I see you first hand and then, then uh, you with a second. Your Excellency. Um, I'm Vladimir Glukhov uh, from non-government organization Go Local. Uh, why so about the name? Uh, we see uh, with my colleagues that uh, central government will never be that strong as it was no more. Uh, the power should go to regional authorities and decentralization which is now in progress and I hope will be active and effective will give more powers to regional uh, governments. We see that uh, non-government organizations can help and influence this process more uh, through its activities. We now do a lot to educate local governments how to use uh, all the products uh, which is given by the European Union and by the central government. But my question is uh, to you, maybe you see how to make it more effective. Uh, what to stress on? I see that we have to change uh, mindset uh, and uh, it's really difficult because the person that has the similar mindset cannot change it. So it's the only way is to, to take the mindset from EU with, uh, uh, because it, it's how we see the progress of our country. Thank you. This decentralization is one of the so-called macro structural changes in Ukraine to empower people in uh, locally in order to uh, uh, take more responsibility. End of May I was in Lviv talking to uh, the heads of uh, different uh, uh, communes, uh, these amalgamated communes and all these people. And they uh, pinpointed what you've just said the question of educating people. All these people who uh, were uh, uh, around 40 different, uh, uh, 40 representatives of different uh, levels of administration, they were telling me we are happy with this reform because we have much more resources than we had. We are able now to create our own budget, but suddenly we realize that we are lacking knowledge, that we don't know how to be effective self-governments, because we've never were trained to do it. We were always working in uh, the system of uh, intervention to the pains of, the, of yesterday, where to repair a road, or where the coal should go to this or other school, how to remedy to different problems. But we don't know how to plan the policy, how to make our plans for territorial development, what are the sources of uh, the future growth, how to make the inventory of assets, how to estimate the value of our assets in order to be able to trigger some economical activity. This is something that is beyond our knowledge. And I was very happy with this demand of people because they were 
not asking us, give us more money, give us more resources. They were asking us, give us more knowledge. This is something that is... Uh, uh, that goes against what you are saying, that these people are unable to change their mindsets. No, they are able to learn and to change their mindsets, provided we help them with this tool. And this tool is this EU LEAD program that uh, we are launching with the Ministry of Regional Development uh, and with uh, Germany, Poland and Sweden as implementing partners to get locally in the sense of training people, helping them to uh, be able to uh, create a sustainable development plans. This decentralization reform is very far of being perfect. It requires further tools of uh, assistance to people in order to uh, really use the potential of uh, Ukrainian regions. But uh, the past period, the 25 uh, past years, have shown that this vertical of power, this controlling of everything by the presidential administration is a recipe for a failure of Ukraine. Such a big country, such a potential, with so many people, brave, good, educated people, you should free this potential of regions. But in order to do so, this assistance in the knowledge, training, and accountability, which goes with it, is of paramount importance. Because if people are not working in a responsible way, they will make more harm than use with using the competences of the regional power. So this is something that requires a lot of attention, a kind of a steering body in Kiev that will help to fix problems regionally and to assist people in how to use the competences locally now. But this is one of the reforms that could eventually help Ukraine to be on the level of its own potential. At the time being, Ukraine is uh, perhaps the country that is uh, the master of misusing their own potential. Uh, before, before giving the uh, uh, opportunity to ask the question to our next uh, participant, I would like to uh, also to, to ask you about one thing, because uh, uh, integration to Europe means uh, integration of ordinary people, not, uh, not mainly uh, only students, uh, uh, not intellectual <laughs> elite. Uh, and uh, what do you believe this is the most essential uh, factor in integrating ordinary people according maybe to Polish uh, experience. It's visa-free regime, it's opportunity to, to have uh, low-cost uh, air travel for 15 uh, euro to any European city. What can be essential steps which can make Ukrainian uh, society and people to feel that they are part and they are belonging to Europe? I don't know. I can't uh, tell you the one tool. It's a combination of different tools. First is the political will. This is uh, this, uh, motivation of people uh, to uh, go beyond uh, own borders. But getting beyond the own borders, I wish also to share with you something that uh, I learned over the past 25 years. If you go abroad, you uh, should not try to be better than people who are citizens of other countries. Your value or your added value in contact with others is how good you know your own country, your own culture, your own old tradition, and uh, how proud are you of your country. Because so many people try to integrate in other societies and they will be never, for first generation at least, on the same level of integration. 
they will be always frustrated because they will never be uh, uh, as good as others are in understanding uh, the pulse of the nation and pulse of the country. So don't try to do it, but be, first of all, a good sample of your culture, of your nation. The visa-free regime is very important, but even without visa-free regime, how many millions of Ukrainians do travel? Now, this is not something that will change the world. We should not overestimate the value of this visa-free regime, because it only concerns people who have biometrical passports, who travel for touristic reasons. This is only perhaps 10% of every uh, uh, of all those uh, who are, are holders of Ukrainian passports. So it will not uh, be a, a kind of a revolution in access uh, to the world. Uh, so we have to see it in uh, all proportions. Uh, the main trigger will be uh, to get rid of the complex of inferiority. Because if people, and I very often see it as one of uh, big obstacles for Ukrainian reforms. This uh, very little trust in own forces. So this complex on inferiority is uh, already a big obstacle for Ukrainians uh, to uh, be uh, uh, more successful. You know? The first step to be successful is Trust yourself. You will master it. And I guess there's no law in cosmology that says that Ukraine will not have the chance to master its own future. So trust yourself and go ahead. Hmm? Nothing. No more advices. Yeah? Uh, thank you. So we are going ahead. And uh, I saw uh, their hand and uh, uh, his neighbor and then you. If I have a question in Russian, okay? Да, Запорожье, Виктор. Ну, мы, например, чувствуем Запорожье, не знаю, как Киеве, что растет очень большой, как бы такой антисоциальный протест, да, против подорожания цен на газ и так далее. Люди становятся все беднее и беднее. Как вы думаете, если в Украине осенью состоится такой социальный взрыв и это приведет к третьему Майдану, не изменится ли политика на 180 градусов в отношении? Европы, так сказать, евроинтеграция и так далее. Насколько вы прогнозируете еще, может, ситуация ухудшится? Ну, по-вашему. The social situation is uh, of a huge concern. Because the, the population over the past two years has lost a lot of its incomes and reserves and uh, uh, became much more uh, uh, poorer than it used to be. And especially in cities as uh, uh, Zaporizhia. Uh, had very interesting talks in Zaporizhia uh, one year ago in May. I, I visited Zaporizhia. And uh, I tried to imagine what it does mean the transformation in Zaporizhia. What are the alternatives for people? What to do uh, if all these big plans? What it would mean for people? What are the alternatives for people in the 700,000 uh, uh, people big city if uh, uh, some big plans do close yeah? because of economical uh, uh, problems? There's no uh, an easy answer to it. Uh, we may uh, all uh, discuss about mistakes being done in the past. Uh, There's a uh, gigantic uh, approach uh, to industry in uh, 30s, uh, 50s, or 70s, but it does not change uh, the situation today. Uh, how to give employment to people, how to give uh, 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 dignity through work to people and how to help people uh, to survive in this uh, 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 difficult situation. 
Uh, one of the routes that we try to uh, help the Ukrainian government to uh, develop is uh, this uh, all investments in uh, small and medium uh, size businesses in order to uh, uh, economize on energy. This energy efficiency uh, programs, every investment could be seen by people as something that could help. But it will not bring a change within two or three months. It is something that is a program for the country for coming five years. Uh, how to uh, help with subsidies, it worked for this past winter that the subsidies to energy uh, help to ease the pain, but uh, this will not be a lasting solution because subsidies uh, are not a lasting solution. So, uh, nevertheless, people should also understand that subsidies on the governmental side to NAFTA has or energy sector as it used to be in previous years if I remember well, in 2012, the energy sector triggered 7.9% of uh, uh, deficit of GDP, which means that from every household, more than $700 were given to energy sector. No one explained to, this, to people that uh, subsidies or deficit triggered by this or other company it is your money that goes to someone. Now the subsidies have been changed from the governmentally distributed subsidies to NAFTA house or energy sector to the subsidies distributed by your bills to NAFTA house because uh, this goes uh, uh, in that way that you have one monopolists who uh, supplies your gas and you, go, you are uh, receiving subsidies uh, to uh, your bills for gas and you pay the same monopolies. So the breaking of this monopolistic structure is also an element of changing the situation, but it will not ease the pain of people in coming autumn or winter because it will take years to change the structure of Ukrainian uh, uh, sector of energy. Every idea uh, coming from society, from the government, how to help people to bridge this economically, uh, this very difficult economic and social situation should be taken very seriously, analyze and look for solutions. Taking the European Union as a responsible for the pains of Ukraine economy is also not justified because this was not that we've triggered the economical crisis in Ukraine. You had another partner who imposed sanctions on Ukraine in all the 2013, especially on heavy industry of Ukraine, especially in the East, uh, in order to trigger also the social unrest and to impact on the uh, political choice of Ukraine to associate with the European Union. So I can't promise you uh, quick solutions I will not quote Churchill, because it is not something that uh, we should refer to uh, uh, in nowadays, because it is uh, about real people and real problems. But it will be uh, hard times also for Ukraine in coming years, in all, uh, unless Ukraine, uh, until Ukraine restructure their own industry and uh, own uh, uh, economical pattern. Such a region as Aparisia, such a region as Kherson, they should be blooming regions uh, thanks to uh, not only heavy industry but also to everything that helps to uh, be uh, uh, food processing regions of Ukraine. Ukraine, due to 
all these monopolistic oligarchic structures from the past period has a post-colonial structure of economy. Raw materials, uh, grain exportation with very, very little added value action. In Zaporizhia where you have Moto Siege, a very good and renowned enterprise, but how many well operating enterprises would you enumerate from your region? Do you have many other examples of someone who could be successful on different markets? Uh, unfortunately, we are running out of time, so we have time. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, so, uh, first you and uh, you and uh, please be short, and uh, these are already asked questions. Alexander Zlatin, uh, Institute, of, Institute of History of Ukraine, National Academy of Sciences. Uh, Your Excellency, first of all, thank you so much for uh, interesting and useful uh, discussion. And um, my question uh, cons is concerning uh, uh, also future. So uh, the first part is uh, regarding um, uh, sanctions, uh, EU sanction on uh, Russia. So according Financial Times, one uh, senior official said that uh, sooner or later need a deep and uh, detailed discussion on uh, the Russian sanctions, uh, and he expects that uh, December summit will be the right moment for this. So how um, Ukraine uh, should assess this uh, kind of uh, comments. And um, the second question is about long-term prospects. Um, what is your personal opinion as a historian and um, diplomat um, regarding um, European security uh, architecture and um, what could be the place of Ukraine and uh, Russia in uh, this uh, system? Thank you. I would not comment on uh, uh, comments on an unknown person about uh, uh, what could happen in, uh, in December. Uh, but uh, what all Ukraine should do is uh, investing in uh, building the Ukrainian project, uh, use uh, the time uh, that Ukraine is in focus of everyone. Ukraine has a unique pattern of support. Uh, European Commission created 40 working places in the European Commission to deal exclusively with Ukraine. None of countries that uh, became members of the European Union in 2004 had such a support. G7 created a support group for Ukraine. So Ukraine is very much in focus, but uh, using this assistance should be also in the interest of Ukraine. If Ukraine does not use the support and this political uh, very favorable uh, time for Ukraine from the point of view of democracies and everyone who wish Ukraine to transform and to be successful, then this deception, the deception and disillusion will be even higher and the price for this disillusion will be very high for Ukraine. There's no vacuum in politics. People will shift interest to other places and Ukrainians should also understand that uh, assistance or political interest, it's as if we were in a market economy. If there is an interest created elsewhere, people will shift to other places in the world in order to gain more or to have more successful ideas. After two and a half years of dealing with Ukraine, Many people tend to see no, it, it goes so slowly. We have to go to something that gives us a quicker benefit. You have to factor in, in Ukrainian actions, that uh, this is not forever that such assistance will be given to Ukraine. So use the chance of all others assisting Ukraine. December, it's almost tomorrow in political terms. Use the time as much as possible. <coughs> uh, 
as one who worked in Brussels for five years, I must say that it was already a very tough decision for European leaders to impose sanctions on Russia. It was much easier to impose sanctions on Belarusia, or on Serbia, or on Zimbabwe than on Russia, given the pattern of interest and impact on Russia, uh, in, uh, of Russia in international policy. So this is something that changed psychologically also the behavior in the European Union. But uh, the decision or the discussions about whether this policy is effective is going on every day. This is not that sanctions are the main objective, the main goal of policy. Sanctions were there in order to impact on policy. So people will use always discussions and uh, will look for different other tools how to be more effective in impacting on Russia's policy. And many people, the question was, whether sanctions were really an effective tool to change the Russian policy. So this is something that goes on every day in different European countries. The vote in the French Senate is also part of the discussion. How to be more effective in order to impact on political changes. Uh, your second question, uh, sorry, uh, Uh, European security and defense policy. <coughs> the Russian aggression against Ukraine shaped or changed the approach of European members to uh, the issue of security. And you see uh, uh, now different events, discussions, meetings uh, that uh, uh, some years ago uh, were almost out of the reach. EU, NATO meetings, uh, uh, different uh, uh, European documents about security and defense, about how to be uh, more uh, uh, effective in defending our values. All these elements of European policy against the hybrid wars, cyber attacks from Russia uh, on different countries. Uh, this is something that completely changed uh, the perspective of uh, cooperation with Russia. Until 2012, uh, the general uh, direction was uh, engaged cooperation with Russia. As you could have seen even in Germany in official documents, Russia starts now to be coined as a threat to national security of Germany. It completely changes the approach to the cooperation with Russia. So it will also have its consequences in the European security and defense policy, in much more integration of uh, mm, uh, security uh, uh, structures uh, uh, on the European continent in order to uh, secure the space. Uh, thank you very much. So very short, very last question. Належною повагою до слухачів, доповідача і організаторів, прошу зрозуміти моє запитання українською мовою. Два коротких запитання. Перше дуже коротке. Ні, два. Два поважні пане. Два. Перше запитання. Перше запитання. Які заплановані або очікувані зміни в програмах ЄС в Україні в найближчі в місяці роки можуть відбутись? Основні, так? І друге запитання, сформулюю складно, але відповіді, може, взагалі не буде, оскільки всім відомо ваша активна діяльність як особистості, як все ж таки опосередкована 
громадянина і представника Польської Республіки, тобто однієї з країн Вишеградської четвірки, традиційного сусіда України. От, всім це відомо. Які, е, хто очікується буде вашим наступником? І хоча представництво ЄС і ЄС – це є колективна і бюрократична організація, але які очікуються впливи? Прошу в дуже етичний спосіб, але все ж таки прокоментувати, які можуть бути впливи цієї особистості на політику ЄС в Україні. Ну, в дуже в делікатній дипломатичній формі, але скажіть. Дякую. So you cannot call his name because everybody knows already. So just everybody knows already. Yeah. <laughs> it's already in a public space. Uh, also, uh, uh, we were asked not to uh, comment it publicly because uh, uh, the uh, person did not get the agreement yet. So it is uh, too early to uh, to announce. Uh, we may say le roi est mort, vive le roi. Alex, je. Прийде колега і ви правильно сказали, що це колективна праця, що це не праця одної людини. І я намагався за цей весь час не працювати то як поляк. Бо якби я би працював як поляк, так перше є польське посолство, а друге – я би не зміг репрезентувати 28 країн Європейського Союзу і європейських інституцій. Все, що ми робимо, це базовано на спільної європейської політиці. І ніколи так не сталося за тих чотири роки, щоб мій хтось із Брусселю сказав від наших інституцій, що я перекрочив свій мандат. Так, це базовано на спільної політиці. І для того... Я рахую, що не буде якихось змін е, е, після закінчення моєго мандату і як е, прийде наступник, бо це вже колективна праця, яка базована на спільних інструкціях, спільних мандатах і спільної думці. Так, я не можу сказати, щоб це було якийсь е, е, польський підхід до України. Може, хтось це по-другому думав, але не було такого, щоб були якісь заперечення до того, що я робив в Україні від наших інституцій. І друге запитання про можливі якісь зміни чи нові проєкти, які Європейський Союз буде реалізувати спільно з українськими е, е, різними структурами. Це е, ну, підтримка для того, щоб реформа державної служби вона перейшла успішно. Це також і е, рахуємо на фінансову підтримку, яка би за тим не прийти. Але це не фінансова підтримка в тим е, розумінню, про яке Багато хто говорив в Україні, топ-ап, що ми, Європейський Союз буде відкривати свої якісь касові рокінки і буде виплачати е, е, українським е, урядовцям е, гроші. Не, бо українська держава ма платити е, своїм урядовцям, а не хтось інший. Це йде на те, щоб перейти е, ці перші реформовані, побудовані інститути яке будуть втілити в життя ці реформи. Друге, це підтримка для українського бізнесу, щоб цей бізнес використав можливості європейського ринку. Український бізнес, він слабкенький в своїм ментальним підгіду. Такий ж він патерналістичний, як і українське суспільство. Багато людей до нас приходить, говорили, ми маємо фантастичний продукт, так продайте його на європейському ринку. Це, не, це ваш продукт, так ви його продайте на, Укра... на європейському ринку, а не, щоб хтось прийшов і ваш продукт звозив в ту чи другу країну і їх продавав. 
але будуємо зараз наступні структури, як це відкрити. Сьогодні була інформація, що в Херсоні ми відкрили спільно з Європейським банком реконструкції розвитку офіс підтримки бізнесу, як побудовати ці структури українські, щоб використати ці можливості виходити на ринки. Бо без зростання економіки нічого хорошого не буде. Для того потрібно все зробити, щоб прийшло зростання економіки, бо воно буде впливати після того і на усі ці і соціальні настрої, як і на можливості використання українського потенціалу, але і інтегровані українців. Третій елемент, який буде постійно задіяний до нашого, нашої підтримки для України, це підтримка для децентралізації, підтримка для того, щоб це пішло тим шляхом, який відповідне до ідеї децентралізації і втілення цього життя. Кожного року Європейський Союз ангажує в Україні від 110 до 150 мільйонів євро на різні проєкти. Від пограничної стражі до гуманітарної допомоги. Всі ці проєкти, якісь маленькі чи більше грошей йдуть. Зараз ми відкрили нові проєкти підтримки для уряду з тим, щоб побудовати експертизу, як писати права, як ці права і закони писати відповідно до європейського законодавства, щоб Україна сьогодні, яка в режиму асоціації з Європейським Союзом, щоб з уряду не вигодили законопроекти, які суперечать зобов'язанням України міжнародним. Друге, це таки ж і допомога Верховної Ради. Це будемо на прикінці наступного тижня ці проекти відкривати, як допомогти знаннями експертизу Верховної Ради, щоб там проекти, які, можливо, вийдуть хорошими від уряду, щоб там хтось їх не поправив, не виправив таким способом, щоб вони були невідповідні до того, яка була їх мета. Бо це такі, що ми розуміємо, що це є один з великих знань українських депутатів. Як це краще ще зробити, ніж це було. І від мікропроєктів аж до великих проєктів постійно, постійно Європейський Союз над тим, на тим працює, як партнер України. Але ключ до успіху – це українська власність реформ. Ми нічого не можемо самі зробити ззовні. Оце потрібно, щоб була задіяність всіх українських інститутів до української реформ. Дякую. Uh, thank you very much, Ambassador. And at the very end, we are always asking our guests uh, a, a message or inspire. Uh, so, uh, can you, in a few words, just tell us what do you believe is important for making, I don't know, career, personal life, values? What do you think is important in life? Can you share with us, f for you personally, and I believe maybe something we can also share? I've already alluded to trust yourself, invest in yourself in a sense of uh, teaching, educating, and uh, uh, formating of your own personality, and embrace the future. Nothing more. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much, Ambassador, for being uh, with us this Friday, and we are hoping that uh, after these two and a half months, we, we will still have many opportunities to see you here in Nikki and to see you in Brussels and somewhere in Europe as well. <laughs>